I'm thrilled to have Lynn from e to open uh, We've done work with Lynn over the past couple of years, and she's going to uh, put on a really good discussion. Um, and as a bit of background, uh, Eli, you're going to do a quick intro. Yeah. Well, I think you already got a piece of the background since I used to work for Lynn at Whirlpool uh, a long while ago, a little while ago. Maybe it's long at this point. Um, so uh, Lynn has been um, really an industry giant in this space. Uh, she's been doing this for a while. She's worked for a number of uh, global entities, lots of interesting experience. She has done what I'm doing up here. Uh, she's taken her, uh, she's done a lot of different road shows and conferences and, and given really helpful and insightful ways to just get a little better at this very complicated work that we do. And that's something I've always admired of Lynn, that we've known each other for a long time. She's able to really break stuff down and make it digestible so you can do something with it. Uh, and she's also a wonderful leader. Uh, she's got a wonderful family, uh, resides in multiple parts of the US. I'm never even quite sure where her true home is when it comes with, with her, but um, very happy to have her come in. She drove in from Michigan, and uh, I think you'll be really pleased when you hear what she has to say. So please uh, join me in welcoming Lynn to our stage. Oh, all right, well, thank you. All right, which way am I going here? This uh, way, right? You just go, yes, it should take you. Okay, so clearly I need a new picture because this was pre-pandemic and, you know, I got that 15 pounds of pandemic uh, <laughs> gift that came along with a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, listen, it's delightful to be here. I was really happy to come up and come back to Ontario and to Mississauga in particular. I used to have a call center here right up the road, like maybe two miles, is it? And came over quite often, and I still have a lot of friends in the area, so really great to be back. I'm originally from nor very northern Minnesota, so kind of the ice box of the nation. So if you start to hear my Minnesota accent come out, you know, give me a, a break on that one. I have lived all over the world, all over the globe. I lived in Japan for four years. So a very global experience, and one of the things that I really like about being in Ontario, being in Mississauga, is just the sheer diversity that is here in comparison to some of the other cities that you would typically find in the US. And so I think I'll, you'll see me bring some of those points and some of those points of views uh, to the discussion. And I would ask that you make this interactive. If you listen to me talk for 45 minutes, it's gonna be super dull and boring. Um, what I will say is I have experience across a lot of different industry. Everything from TE connectivity, which is a maker of connectors and sensors that nobody has ever heard of, but it's in, in your car, in, you know, in your you know, DVR player, in your TV. You, know, you need a connector or sensor, they probably made it. They only have two comp competitors. I've also worked at, you heard me talk about appliances. If you need any help picking out a cooking appliance, you just let me know and I'll walk you through how we guided people on the sales floor to have those interactive discussions rather than how much do you want to pay? You know, how many features do you want? You know, that kind of thing. And then I've worked in telecommunications. I worked there for about 11 years. Everything from a very small uh, company that was in basically emerging markets only. So think Tanzania. So yes, I have stayed at the Hotel Rwanda and uh, service customers out of basically a, a brick building, which isn't really brick, it was like mud bricks in Chad. And it was painted spray paint blue, and that was our store. And the number one product that we sold out of there was a manual recharger for a phone where people would prop up their bike and put their kid on there to pedal. So kid you not, so that was, but I've also worked at Comcast. So one of the largest companies in the US in, and a Fortune 500 obviously. And so run call center operations of 6,000 people. And so I've also got a lot, a lot of good stories to tell. So if I don't tell them here, you know, hit, hit me up over a glass of wine. Okay. With that, um, firefighting fighting mode. How many of you often feel like you have a lot of data, but no information? You feel like you're jumping from one burning building and all you do is hit a trampoline and catapult into another burning building. If you've worked in this industry long enough, that's how you feel. And you know what? It often gives you a headache. 
But what I'm going to try to bring to this discussion today is some tics, tips and tricks of what you can do to create a mindset within your company so that the call center isn't the stepchild of the organization, that there is a clear understanding of the value that is delivered, that your financial organization can have a better and easier understanding of the work you do and the importance that it brings. And some things that I've run into that have worked for me, and maybe some that haven't worked very well. So we'll talk about those as well, because I think you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. So a little bit about E2 Open. Anybody ever heard of this company? No, didn't think so. So we are a supply chain software as a service company. And what we do is we run things like your supply planning. So think about if you're buying computers from Intel or Apple, it's our supply planning uh, platform that is used. If you're receiving um, computers from Dell, they use our platform. If you're receiving a platform or a, a if you see the CXX train going by, that's our um, TMS platform. We're tracking them, tracing those, those cars. If you receive a delivery from DHL, that is also our platform. So these are very large companies, whether it's Maersk or it's CXS, it's Burlington Northern, um, anybody that's going to ship something somewhere for some reason, they're likely on our platform or someone else's platform similar to ours. It's a very fragmented business and a very fragmented industry. So our business is about 750 million for my company and we own and have purchased all these different groupings. So whether it's channel business, planning business, it's the TMS for us, which is the trucks that are going by uh, as you see them on the road, you see those scan numbers. That's all the different things that we run. And what we try to do is bring these different platforms together to make it seamless for, com for companies. Now, that all sounds great. It looks really pretty on the slide. So what do you think happens in the back end? Guesses? You got somebody on the phone in India trying to figure out what product set a customer has and how they can help them. So literally acquisition after acquisition on different uh, platforms on five different versions of Salesforce. Yes, always fun. So a lot of challenges within the context and the taking care of customers is what I've been facing. So I did try to retire about a year and a half ago and a friend of mine called me and she said, Lynn, I'm working at this company, it's called E2Open, I had been at TE, and we really need a lot of help. And my husband was really tired of the honey-do list, <laughs> true story. So I said, how do you feel about me going back to work? What do you think he said? He's like, yeah, let's yeah. do it. No, like say that with a little more enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I think that's a great idea. One, I like the money, and, and two, you're out of the house. So I went back to work and I literally was faced with chaos, complete and utter chaos. So, you know, I called my friend Eli, I also called another friend to say, you know what, we really need to look at what is our journey for our customers across these big platforms in a time of upheaval when supply chain can't deliver and everyone's complaining to everyone for every reason possible. And by the way, we've trained them to expect something to be delivered, you know, basically tomorrow because Amazon's not now taught us how to do that, right? Or at least taught us to have that expectation. All right. So that's kind of the premise that I came in with. So I'm meeting my day with my boss, my new boss, the CEO, and I said, look, you know what? I know you think we get a lot of complaints, but I want to just let you know that the top of the complaints that you're getting, you know, those 10 that you get a week, is the tip of the iceberg. If they're complaining to you, there's a whole lot of other people that aren't complaining at all. And why aren't they complaining? Anybody got an idea? Why don't they complain? What's that? Can't be bothered. Can't be bothered. That's right. It's like trained helplessness. You're not going to do anything anyway. So they're afraid. They're afraid. That's absolutely right. Because why? 
somebody's going to get in trouble, especially in B2B businesses like ours. They don't want to call and get their sales guy in trouble because what will happen to the sales guy? He'll get moved to a different account, and then you got to train the new person. So there's a lot of risk. So the, these are reasons why customers won't contact you. Guess what? That was a big aha moment for our finance department and for our CEO because they're thinking, oh, we've got all these escalations. Well, my friends, look at everything below the waterline. We need to solve for that, not just for this tip of the, the iceberg. Does it make sense to everybody? I haven't taught you anything new yet, have I? No. Okay. So then another thing that helped me is to say, you know what, all right, we've done some math on this. We're looking at it. Uh, we've done some research, and I'm going to show you another piece of research that I did. Our customers have an extreme sensitivity to problems. So if you are in the Hilton and your internet doesn't work, how do you feel? Not, not good. Annoyed. What if you're in the hotel and your internet's intermittent and you've got a call with your CEO? Now how do you feel? Seriously, <laughs> yeah, seriously frustrated, like, am I going to do this on my phone? What if you're in the hotel and your internet's not really working because they were trying out uh, different things and they can't get it fixed. And by the way, your global pass on your phone has expired. You're being throttled on data. Now how stressed are you? Yeah, freaking out. So, you know, I now have had a lot of problems and my sensitivity is very high. Same thing with your customers. So that's why it's important, back to Eli's point on the omni-channel, you not only need to know that one complaint, you need to know if they also went to the website. And, oh, they tried to chat with you, too. And they talked to their friend Bob over there, who happens to work for Comcast. Like, literally, literally at Comcast, we gave out cards to every single employee. Why? Not because they needed business cards, but because... Comcast was such a target for customer service at one point in time that our employees were getting accosted at like the football game with their high school student or at the hockey rink. Uh, you work for, Com you have a Comcast jacket on? I have a problem with service. I literally have still got, I still get calls about, I heard you used to work at Comcast. Can you get me help? <laughs> uh, not kidding. I got one two weeks ago. Got one two weeks ago. By the way, I got one for Whirlpool too, so. No, it wasn't from you. So anyway, the point is, then you can take this and you can put it against churn. Or you can take this data, and by the way, this is generalizable to industry. I've done it five different times. And within uh, all industries, it comes within a few percentage points. So I, I've done this research multiple times. So now you can say, and this is what a contact costs us, and then this is what the result is in terms of churn. And now you can start to say, if I can reduce the number of times they contact us, not only can I take uh, money out of my contact center budget because I can reduce the number of contacts, let me allow them to talk a little longer so that they can solve the problem the first time. And now you can measure other things like, hey, how many times have they had a problem? That's probably more important than how long you actually spent on the phone with them you can start to make those trade-offs. So for all of you data geeks, this is really important because you can put dollars to it. And it doesn't matter if it's my transaction, which is really long because I'm talking to Dell about some system, or it's a transactional what's my balance discussion. You can absolutely, you can absolutely see it. So I use this, this slide a lot, and then I put dollars to it, and then I go talk to my CFO. I'm like, oh, you want to cut me those head count? Want, to, want me to cut those? Well, all right, they're going to have a lot more problems because I'm going to lose my good people because they're going to see that we're cutting. And here's how it fits together. Just yesterday I had this conversation. I said, you know what? That's fine. You can cut those, but in peak season, I'm going to spend it all again, and it's going to be more. Is, are you sure that's the decision you want me to take? And then all of a sudden you have a different discussion. So anyway, that's what I was facing. A ton of problems, uh, a ton of repeat problems, 
an organization that didn't really understand how things fit together, because there's a lot of puzzle pieces. And it was like doing a puzzle, but you sometimes get that puzzle and you've got no picture. So you have no idea how the pieces fit together. So that was kind of our call to action. And so I had a ch choice and I called a couple friends. You know, it's kind of like phone a friend on those TV shows. Okay, so my first friend I, f I phoned was uh, Eli. I'm like, I need to do some journey mapping. Why? Because we had no idea what our big customers, our enterprise customers were experiencing. So think Maersk, think uh, DB Schenker, think Dell, think Intel. We also had a lot of smaller clients that maybe only had one of our platforms, not all six. So we had to do some journey mapping to really almost staple ourselves to an order to figure out what the experience was. And then using that data, we did a body of work that's called a dissatisfaction survey. So we did that body of work with um, a com company called CCMC, and I've done this across six different companies. And the big difference between a CSAT survey and a DISSAT survey is in CSAT, I'm asking, how much do you love me? Tell me everything about what you love. Do you like my shirt? How about my necklace? How about this? How about that? In a DISSAT survey, I ask, what is every evil bad thing I've ever done to you? And I give them a menu to choose from, which, by the way, I got out of the work that we did with Eli because he basically identified all the pain points of the organization. And then we took that to the DISSAT sur survey. Oh, I don't pick up the phone fast enough. I don't return calls. I don't close out cases. I don't get the product fixed. And then we asked, how mad did that make you? and which was your most important problem. Because sometimes I just have irritants, and sometimes these are big problems where I can't, can't run my software. Right? So by parsing that out, it allowed us to say, where should we go work? And it was a little bit challenging because a lot of it was absolutely squarely in the sights of our operation of the contact center. And I'm going to get into exactly what we did. Now, the good news is most of that stuff's a lot cheaper to fix than going to fix the software. It's a lot cheaper to train, to hire the right people, to you know, get them with discretionary effort, to reward them, all those things. It is a little bit heavy lift, but it is a lot less expensive. So I'll walk you through all of that. But with this, that's how where you see CCMC the interview program, and this is what we got. So, you know, just take all this in, and um, you can look at this data, and you can say, holy crap, what is she doing on stage talking about a world-class experience? You know, about 20% satisfaction, a minus 20 MPS. Pretty ugly, huh? Really ugly. Really, really ugly. So part of this, and about half of it, is indicative of the industry. So nobody heard of supply chain prior to, um, I don't know, maybe 2020. Nobody was talking about supply chain. What supply chain? Why? Because it worked. We had a nice, flat, global supply chain. We didn't have any bottlenecks. We didn't have any issues with ports, very rarely. And then the pandemic hit. And then everybody's ordering everything online. And you can't get product, and you can't get parts, and you can't get little connectors that are made in uh, Malaysia that need to go in electric vehicles, which means you can't get the vehicle. All these things sort of play together, right? That's supply planning, demand planning. And so even though we had very low MPS, and you expect that when you're asking a DISSAT survey, right? So it's automatically going to be depressed by a lot of points. We had 40% citing that E2Open was the best provider. So I'm like the tallest short person. Right? <laughs> Great. Right. So what we used this for was to say, you know what? We're bad, so don't cut my department anymore. Right? Facts are your friends. I don't really like these facts, but you know what? Facts are your friends. Now I can say, oh, you want to cut those headcount? How low do you want our MPS to go exactly? That's a really hard argument with uh, finance. They're like, oh, I don't want to be responsible for that. Sure, you can have your head comb. But we were able to say, here's four areas we need to work on, right? Customer support was number one. Okay, some of that was very basic training, right? very basic. 
We're going to walk through all that. But two of them were really important that are cross-functional. One is ease of doing business. Don't forget that, ease of doing business. And then the second was value for price paid. Some of that is just looking at the products, what value did they bring, and how is marketing communicating that with our customers. So this gives us a roadmap of how to work and what needs to be worked on. Right? It also gives us a document, the one pager, that I'm able to wave in front of all my executive peers and say, oh, look, we're nearly the best. I need help with this communication. But finance, don't cut my people unless you want lower MPS scores. So now you've got it all on one page. It's really easy to understand, and it's super hard to argue against. Questions so far? People in the back are sleeping? I've bored you all to tears? OK. So I want to walk through how this survey actually worked, because you're like, dis that survey. Holy crap, I can't sell that to my boss. OK, so what we did essentially is said, hey, have you ever had a problem? I'm going to ask you this. So have you ever had a problem with E2 Open? You can play along. You can be. Yes. Yes, yes, we've had a problem. OK. So you can see on the top, one of the 45, that's not you. One of the 55 had a problem. So did you contact me? Yes or no? No. No, OK. 15% did not contact. So now I go over and I look at, what was their very satisfied score on a scale of one to five? Mm, 20%. What was your MPS? Minus 55. Holy crap. How many people did you tell about it? Lots. Lots. She told four, at least four people. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that tells me a lot. You know what? I don't like those non-contactors because they have a very low MPS score. They're not doing anything for me. I need to get them to contact me. But guess what? They're either afraid or they just don't believe you're going to do anything about it. So I need to solve for those things. I need you to call. OK, Graham, you're going to play with me now, right? OK, here we go. All right, you're a customer. Did you have, a, have an issue with us? You had an issue. Sure did. Yeah, a big issue. A big issue. OK, did you contact us? I tried to. You tried to contact us. OK, good. Did we exceed your expectations? Were you satisfied? Were you mollified? Or were you dissatisfied? I was mollified. You were mollified. OK, so you have a 5% very satisfied, but a minus 45 in NPS. And you told five friends. You told that whole table about how bad we are. Wow. Couldn't wait you couldn't wait to tell them. OK. All right, we're going to play over here one more time. All right. You're our customer, right? Did you have a problem? I sure did. You had a problem. OK. And did you contact us? I did. You contacted? OK, he contacted. And were you dissatisfied or were you exceeded? I was very dissatisfied. Very dissatisfied. Oh my gosh, 40% of our people were very dissatisfied. Yeah, I hate when that happens. 1% very satisfied, minus 90 MPS. Holy crap, right? Well, now I can do this by every single product that I have and every single customer by grouping. So now I know exactly and precisely where to work. And that's the power of this because it tells me, all right, you know what? If I can just get them to contact me, I can raise that score. And if I can just move them from dissatisfied to satisfied, I go from minus 90 to 70. So I don't have to seven, plus seven. So I don't have to like delight them. I just like have to answer the phone, right? And give them an answer that they can believe in. So this allows me to make improvements over time. Everybody have fun with that game? Yeah, this is real data, by the way. It's, it's uh, sort of disguised, but not really. Yes? Nope, they didn't, they didn't contact. No, 15%. We asked him, did you have a problem? First question. Have you ever had an issue with us? Y you had an issue. Did you contact us about that issue? And they said no. And so then we asked that within that survey. Elsewhere within that survey, we asked them, you know, how overall are you satisfied with 
uh, E2Open, you know, and we ask them the standard MPS questions, like how willing are you recommend? You had a problem, how many people did you tell about it? And then we go back and we cross tab this data, okay? Does that make sense? So that's how we get to it. But then to go with my other page that we just had earlier, now I can say, all right, and I want to spend money just by moving people from very dissatisfied up to mollified or satisfied. You know, I'd love to get them to exceeded, but you're not going to get there. So it's just trying to shift the curve a little bit. That gets a lot more attention than trying to say, oh, I want to exceed everybody's expectations, because it doesn't matter. Yes, of course. Yeah, now what you can do with this data, if you decide to um, do a study like this, um, you can basically say, how much is my customer worth? You can basically say, oh, my business banking customers are worth this, but my individual customers are worth that. If they have three products for me, they're worth something else. And then you put the dollar value to all that, and you can quantify how much of your business is at risk. So you got to do the journey maps first to know what, what area to ask about. And I've done this at six different companies, and every one of them has come out like this. Doesn't matter, you know, no, this is probably the worst MPS score, including uh, against Comcast, but I don't really want to admit that. <laughs> but it comes out like this, and it tells you where to go work. And even better, if you can partner with your finance people and then cut the data to help them, it allows you to get the right investment. So if you wanted to go get natural language or generative AI or whatever it is, and you say, you know what, if I have generative AI, I can move a bunch of people from dissat to sat. This is what it'll do to me. And by the way, I can reduce the risk of losing customers by this amount. Okay? All right. So we really then, after listening to our customers, looked at our strategy, said, what do we need to work on? And so we said, you know what? We have to develop these strategic partnerships. We have very big customers. We, didn't, we, we basically treated them all exactly the same. Didn't matter like if you're in a bank and you had $5 million with us versus $5 with us. Essentially, we treated every customer the same. And then we really didn't add a lot of value. So we had these uh, success managers, but they were just chasing tickets. So we really looked at how do you bring that down to more of a customer service role and create the customer success managers where they're really listening to their client and saying, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What are you doing? So really change that strategic role. And then you'll see this theme of be easier to do business with. Like how many steps do you really need? How many people actually need to approve that? And making it easier to just reach us. Like literally, we have no IVR. Like no IVR. Which I know sounds crazy, but for our business, it doesn't make sense. When I was at Comcast, oh my god, you had to have an IVR. I had to. I wouldn't be able to staff the contact center if I didn't have one. But it all depends on your business. And maybe for some groups of customers, when I was at Whirlpool, you bought Gen Air, we didn't put you through an IVR. You got a person right away. We staffed to that. You bought Roper, you were going to get help online because we couldn't afford to help you because essentially that product uh, lost money all day long. So you want to tailor your experience to what you want to deliver with that customer as well. But I digress. And then the last piece was really using our data, those previous two slides, to work with our sales department and to work with our finance people to have them understand the impact of this operations has on the total experience and how easy or hard it is for a salesperson to then renew a client. Most of these customers are multi-million dollar deals. They're usually on three to five year renewal cycles. So they might have golden handcuffs for a few years, but if I treat them very poorly, they're not going to renew. 
Okay, so we set up to become a wholly customer-centric organization. This is just a five-step program. You feel free to copy this whole thing. I've used it across multiple companies, but it basically allows you to have that conversation to say, hey, where am I at? You know, <laughs> is my company thinking that the contact center and the customer strategy is a responsibility of that call center or that contact center or that customer experience center? Or is customer-centric DNA in every employee's mindset and they're talking about the customer regularly? And you can kind of see where your journey is. And so what we did, I'm, I'm not going to read this to you. You'll get these slides. You don't have to take pictures. You can if you want. But um, we laid out a plan, right? So we said, very typically, people, process, technology, and then optimization, which in my mind is how do you win awards? Right? How do you become world class? World class for me does not mean that I am wowing every customer every single time. It's about delivering a consistently trusted, reliable experience that you can count on. If I don't particularly like McDonald's food, but I can trust that if I go in the bathroom, it will be clean and sanitized and I won't be offended, unlike most gas stations. So if I'm going to choose, I'm going to go to the McDonald's for the restroom, not for the food. Does that make sense? You guys are supposed to laugh at that joke. OK. It is a tough group. I don't know. All right. So then what we took that strategy of the five step stepping stones, those two pages, and we said, all right, we need a voice of the customer framework because we have essentially nine different companies that have all come together in one company, very different cultures across the globe. How do we build a voice of the customer into our product development, into our sales, into our entire organization. And these, this was basically what I, I used to say, OK, here's the things that I need. Here's how we are going to measure ourselves. And I actually asked my ELT and then the senior leadership team to judge us on these criteria. Give me a scale of 1 to 5. I didn't put it on here, but that's how I did I basically scale 1 to 5. How do you think we're doing on all these things? And then I use that data to go back and say, where should we work? How should we work? What should we do? So you can have all the data in the world. The biggest challenge you will face is change management. Getting people to buy in, bringing them along. You know where you want to go. You know exactly what you need to do. But the 10 people behind you that don't think about this on a daily basis have no idea. Even the acronyms you use, like IVRU versus IVR versus VRU, they're like, what? Huh? They're very confused, right? Is it a call center? Is it a contact center? Is it an experience center? What is it? Why do you use those words? Are these reps? Are they consultants? What do they do? So we put in this voice of the customer system, and we basically are looking at the strong feedback loop to drive our improvements. So think about a biweekly cadence of meetings. Here's what our data are telling us out of the contact center. Here's what it is by product. Not too terribly complex. You don't have to do this. And some of you are, probably have very sophisticated systems that are doing this today. But if you don't, you can essentially do this in, in Excel on slicers. So it's not, you don't have to overthink it. Okay? But use the data you have. And then you can just get better over time. Perfection is the enemy of progress. OK, so now I wanted to dive a little bit more deeply into the employee experience. And the reason I wanted to do that is because if you go back to the data and you look at what the data told me, is basically your training and your people, they don't really know what they're doing. They're just giving bad answers. They really don't know what to say. And it's because you're nine different companies. So we set out to build one culture, one E2 open way. Here's what it's going to look like. And we're in the process of doing that now. But I've done that at other companies. And when you do that, you get buy-in, you get lower retention, you get discretionary effort. And that rewards and gamification makes a huge difference. It also plays into, do I have teams at home versus do I have teams remotely? And what does that look like? And what is my uh, influencer circle look like? And how do I take those change people that hate change and have them be change champions? Like, you're responsible for the change on your team because you don't like change. Right? And so how do you use that psycholo psychology or reverse psychology 
to help you get to where you want to, want to be. If you don't know where you're going to go, it's very hard to do. That's why you've got to have the five steps, the plan by quarter or by year half, and then really laying out where are you at today. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the post-pandemic work world. I'm sure you saw on the news yesterday about the insurance companies in the U.S. that basically said, I don't care, I told you you could work from home forever, everybody back to the office. How old do you think that went over? Has anybody in this room had that experience? Like you're telling your people to get back to work or you're, and how did that go for you? Yeah, really comfortable working from home. Absolutely. I had to go shopping. I had to buy cool shoes because, you know, <laughs> got to have them. You're right. You have to talk about the benefits. So you basically had three years of college students that graduated and entered the workforce and probably had never left their dormitory, right? So, but it's very interesting of how, what, what we did to get people back to work. Now, some of it's generational, some of it is, and I'll show you where we are across the globe and you'll about uh, pass out from the number of locations. But we took a very deliberate plan. We surveyed everybody. Of, we didn't guarantee that we were gonna follow the survey results, but we did survey everybody to understand what their barriers were and how we could accommodate some of those barriers. We did basically in my area of operation, which is a third of the company, say, all right, we're going to strategically set out where do we want people, how do we want them, and what percentage of people can work from home full time? And how do you earn the right to work from home full time? So we set that out as uh, responsibilities and goals. And we also set rules around when you'd have to come back to the office full time if you weren't hitting the rules that we set into place. Right. So. Again, you know, it, work has changed. It's place constrained, time constrained. I had a meeting last night at eight o'clock. Why? Because it's global. And, you know, I had to be able to be on the phone with the people in Singapore at 8 p.m., which is their 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, go ahead, yes. Yeah, I, I would say for me, time constraint is, is one of the bigger issues that I have. It's actually, we haven't had that much problem with people getting back to work. Why? Because you'll see my numbers, the vast majority of my team is overseas. And they work in places like Singapore and Malaysia and India. And how big are the rooms in Malaysia, Singapore, and India that they live in? They're sharing a house with, you know, 12 people and, you know, their mom's hovering over them every five seconds and they want to go back to work. Mm -hmm. So I did not have a problem necessarily getting them back in. It's more the hours of work, mm -hmm. and do they want to work US hours or not, and what hours of operation do they want to work, and that's been the bigger challenge to your point. So I, I think it's not an either or, and that's why I think you want to study your business. Who are your customers? What are their expectations? And then you really do have to balance that with your employee expectations. And at some point, you are going to have to say to some of them that if you just can't meet their needs, you know, I'm sorry, Graham, you're a really great guy. I'm really glad you had the opportunity to work here. Um, the, this is how it is going to be for us, and these are the five reasons why. And you know what? I wish you all the best, and let me know, you know what your transition plan is. I hate to do it, but sometimes that's what you're going to have to do because it's just not always going to work for everybody.
start creating a worksheet that you're having going with one-on-ones with your employees and see face-to-face meetings you're working to cross-functionally mark what you did or whoever you're supporting. Yep. Share it on those days too so that you get the biggest bang for your buck. Not just showing up willy-nilly because you're fancy. Right. So, yeah, that's exactly right. So I run a team that's called LAS, Logistics as a Service. It's basically a BPO. And they will do um, business process outsourcing for some of the biggest organizations out there. You know, whether it's um, candy companies or Ferraro, Ferraro, we do theirs. We do Mars, M&M. So same thing. We want them to come in as teams. So we say, all right, Team A, you're in on Monday. Team B, you're in on Wednesday, Thursday, and you know Team C, you're coming in, you know Tuesday, Thursday, because we're shrinking our office space and we are hoteling a lot more. Oh, you want to come? You want your own space? Do you want your own space? You want your own assigned desk? Yeah. Yeah, he wants his own assigned desk. Okay, great. Um, in order to get your own desk, you have to come in four to five days a week. No, we had actually have a bunch of people that said yes, and they're like, yep, I don't want to work from home. I want my own desk. Okay, that's a perk. Right. So you just have to figure out from your business what really works, okay? All right, so there's my footprint. How do you like that? Yeah. So, you know, it was really kind of crazy, but what we wanted to do is say, where do we want to be? Where do we want to be in two years? And then build out those locations of where we want to be. So in Bangalore, rather than having one location, we have three. We're going to go to four. Why? Because the city's huge, and much like here, it's very tough to get from the east side of the city to the west side of the city. It could take you two hours. You know, if you're in Phoenix, it takes you like three and a half hours to get across the city. So you may as well be in a whole other state. So we were very deliberate in what communities we were building out in. So Pune and Hyderabad in India, and don't look at the map too closely. I know Dortrecht is not really in the middle of the ocean. Um, <laughs> that's my marketing people adjusting that background to fit. So just ignore that. But anyway, we we're very specific about where we wanted people to sit. And then we built that out um, from this footprint. And then we basically said, you know what? If you are too far from an office, which is for us 30 minutes of a commute, then you can work with your manager and you can be designated full-time work from home. Right? But we still want you to come in and then you say two days a month, two days, whatever. Right? But our full-time work, we were very deliberate in saying 30 minutes. We're not gonna quibble over five minutes. And then if you have an exception, you work it with your manager. And then we look at exceptions at the exec team every quarter just to see why are people not coming in? You know, like you're pregnant and you are on bed rest. Like we're not going to ask you to come into work. Okay, so we said basically this is what we want to be. We want balance, follow the sun, take advantage of low-cost countries and low-cost locations. So we do have some low-cost locations in the U.S. For example, Holland, Michigan, where I live nearby. It's pretty low. Lots of universities. The salary levels are, you know, starting salary forty thousand. US dollars. So I'm going to hire there. I'm going to hire in Davenport. Same thing. A quad city is very low, low price. And look for some of those communities that we already have. And then we're really going to look at what our balance is and what we want to be. And we also have a stated goal of no more than 20% work from home full time. Because we want to protect our culture and we want to protect that. Those of us that have that mess, guess where I, guess where I work? everywhere. I mostly work on Delta Airlines. Yeah. And I usually stay at some Hilton someplace for some reason. Right? So there are a few of us that were basically road warriors. Why? Because we have to see our people. But this protects, the, for us, protects the culture, protects the cost structure, and protects the way that we go and manage that four box of time and space in work. Okay. So here's a whole bunch of uh, notes on it, but we were really balancing collaboration and the cost to be able to execute against people traveling. And then the other thing that we did, which probably all of you do, is you know call centers run on food, right? So we have designated days of breakfast. We have designated days of lunch. We have samosa snack. We've got all sorts of different things that are going on depending on where you're at. And of course, we incorporate all that into our 
rewards and recognition. We use the military challenge coins and all that kind of stuff that I can talk about over wine. But it, yeah, exactly. And calories. <laughs> and there's a reason why before I went into call center operations, I was at fighting weight in the US military and I wouldn't even qualify today, so yes. <laughs> All right, some of the things that we had to consider that you may or may not have to consider are these cultural divergencies that we have. So um, time zones, the communications um, expectations. And you do see a little of that when you have an area that's got a lot of infiltration of uh, diversity and folks moving in. One of the things that we had to do, we just opened a new location in Peru and we're putting in a language coach. It's not that they don't know the lingu English language. Obviously, I don't know the English language here. But <laughs> it's the accent, right? It's, it's the intonation. So when we go to Bangalore, the folks in Bangalore, they speak the Queen's English. Well, they're talking to mostly Americans that do not speak the Queen's English. And so that's a little bit of a challenge. The other challenge is their first language usually has the emphasis on the second syllable rather than the first syllable. So they will say a word like syllable, they'll say syllable. And so if my ear isn't tuned to listening to an accent, then it becomes difficult. So we literally put in language and intonation coaches, not English coaches, but language and intonation coaches, so that the speech patterns were easier to understand. Okay. And so those are some of the ticks and, uh, tips and tricks that we had to do. And maybe in order to understand me, you need to speak hockey and you need to talk with a long O, you know? <laughs> so. so a foundation of our transformation really was moving from these very disconnected groups into a true stack, really moving the organization from uh, customer care is the responsibility of that customer care group versus it's everybody's responsibility, really showing the money on where our problems are and what we need to do. And then I'll just dive into two more slides and then I think I'm probably over time because I've talked too much as usual. But we really put forth a program that is our training foundational program. It has pay for performance against it, it's got requirements against it, but essentially it's know me, care about me, solve for me, help me grow. Okay. Some of you may have already heard this or seen something similar. But this makes it very easy to say, oh, you need to take the Help Me Grow um, segment. And it allows us to say where we're going to invest and why and for what reason. And this was probably our easiest way to get to ROI. So I'm going to basically go in and think about being engaging. So it goes back to uh, empathy perspective, right? So how do you engage with a customer? A lot of our folks you know, came out of tech industry in India and really didn't want to talk to people. So there they are. A friendly 90 second interaction, was it worth? So if you teach your whole organization about where the value is, it really helps. Um, use your data to support the reasoning on trading. If you look at proactively giving advice on how to avoid problems, usually people didn't want to talk about that. Right. So next time you could do this. This gave them a way to role play and practice. And this is generalizable across all industries, including banking. Okay, I'm gonna talk about how we go back to engineering the experience. So again, I have these technology geeks that really don't like to talk on the phone and they really don't wanna, they wanna they're very rules bound and again, we're in Asia Pac where rules are more valued and it's more patriarchal. So we taught them to role play. All right, here's the typical script, and these probably look very familiar to you. You can't transfer funds from this account. To give them the opportunity to practice, we said, okay, how could you do that in a, a way that we call behavioral economics? In other words, you're making a deposit with your customer. They had to rewrite it and come up with it. Oh, I see the issue. It looks like we need to get your other account authorized. Right, just by changing what you're saying, it doesn't mean that the result's any different, but how you say it and the phrases you use makes a huge difference. I used this at Comcast, and it used to be that we'd say, yeah, you're gonna 
Anybody had service from their technology provider or cable provider? How'd that go for you? Ugly? Yeah. And they say, yeah, you have to be home for eight hours, right? Right. And we might show up. And we might fall asleep on your couch. Well, what we would do is we change that conversation. We say, I'm really sorry that you needed service. Let me first check and see if there's an outage in your area. Oh, I see it's not in your area. It looks like it's your area. And then, you know, you usually have the script of going through 19 steps, and they've already tried all those. And you say, have you been online and, and tried the troubleshooting uh, tricks? And they say, yes. Okay, great. Would you like a service person to come out? Yes, I would. Okay. I have some options for you. Like, you always want to give options and solutions. I could give you Monday from 10 to 2 or, you know, 8 to noon. Or I can give you Saturday, but that would be an all-day appointment. Which would you prefer? I'll take the Monday. Monday. Okay. All right. I'm really sorry that you're not going to be able to have internet over the weekend. Here's some options for you. You can use Xfinity and that... Anybody in your neighborhood, you'll be able to ride on theirs. Or you can use your hotspot. So I give them more options and more solutions. And we literally trained this to all of our employees. So same thing as what we're doing here, is to give options and solutions. And what you end up with is a much higher quality of experience and a much lower effort score. Right. So here's how I measure it. So, you know, this is all nice. It sounds like a lot of theory. It makes sense to everybody. But how do you know it's getting done? I don't have a really cool speech and text analytics tool. But what I do measure in the back post-call, post-transactional, is I ask, was your agent knowledgeable, scale of 1 to 5? Did they provide options and solutions to you? And did they treat you as a valued customer? Why or why not? So scale of one to five for those first three. So I'll ask effort. And then those three other ones are all measured at the agent level and reviewed with, with that consultant. Okay? And then the why or why nots give you all that dirt to go dig and fix even more here. Make sense? All right. And then you can see everything that's in process. We're in the middle of putting in pay for performance, we're doing gamification, because I have tons of people under the age of 30. You know, I, I don't need to do gamification for people over the age of 55, they don't really don't care. <laughs> but under the age of 30, they love games. They just love it. My daughter's playing games with me right now. She's like, get out there and move, mom, you're behind on our, you know, competition. So, you know, again, looking at process, looking, using all my data to say, how can I simplify the process, make it easier. So that's my mantra, easy, easy, easy. And I ask everybody in the, in the company, and they, they know I do that, excuse me. Um, your decision, is that going to make it? Smarter or easier? Easier. Okay. Easier, good. How about yours? So here's a little practical exercise. You can take this with you. Um, these are things that I grade myself on when I first come to a company. I give, give the company a score, and I then present that to my CEO or the ELT and say, hey, I think we're wasting a lot of money here. Do you want to come on this journey with me to reduce cost and deliver a better experience overall? So I hope that was helpful. Any questions, any comments, concerns? All right. Anybody still awake? Here, here. All right, thank you.